Good morning. Welcome to Guerrilla Discipleship. My name is Kevin Baker. I'm your host. I'm glad to be with you another week and talking about what it looks like to be disciple makers and how we can participate with God in, in the building of his kingdom here on earth. I want to begin this uh, session with you talking a little bit and asking you to think, what is it that you think God's ultimate desire is? I mean, I want you to think big picture, end of times. Many of us in the church, I think, have grown up knowing or believing or being taught that, you know, there's a few that will be uh, rescued from sin and destruction, but most will go, um, well, most will be separated from God for eternity. We've heard messages like that. There's certainly scripture. Jesus himself invited us into the narrow path, uh, saying that the narrow way leads to life, but the wide path leads to destruction and that many are taking the wide path. So there's lots of, of scripture about that, but let me ask you this about God's heart. Does God care about that? Does God care that there are many heading toward destruction, that there are many who are not ex experiencing the love, the joy, the peace of God? Is God sort of become pluralistic He's like, well, you know, I'm, I'm one God of many gods. I know everybody has the opportunity to make a choice as to what they believe. I mean, is that is that the heart of God? Or is the heart of God like a longing father who sees how often his children make mistakes and suffer the consequences, who feel often lost and alone and, and hopeless even, all the while that the father is just waiting to be a blessing and wanting to rescue. You know, the Bible tells us that Jesus came for the sick because the well don't need a doctor. I don't think he was implying that, well, there's a small portion that are sick and the rest don't. I think he was saying that, you know, look, if you don't feel like you're sick, then probably my life and my ministry are going to mean nothing to you. But if you are sick, if you are brokenhearted, if you are feeling the crush of sin and, and hopelessness, I came for you. So it's just Jesus turning their own perspective on them. I don't think that it was Jesus saying, ah, there's a few sick people I came down to bring healing to them. The rest of you guys are okay. Let me just tell you what I believe in this. And I believe this passionately. I believe that Jesus died to cover the sin, to forgive the sin, to pay the price for the sin of all humanity for all of time. What Jesus did on the cross, the payment that he offered on our behalf, the substitute that he became on behalf was for behalf of the whole world. Now, Here's the thing, all of the sin of the world was placed on Jesus' shoulders. My sin, your sin, the sin of folks who don't know him, the sin of, of Hindus and Muslims and Buddhists, all sorts of folks, uh, atheists, agnostics, all of the sins of the world. For we were all once as they were, far from God, caught up in our own rebellion. God demonstrated his love for us that while we were still far from him, he died from us. So God didn't just die for those of us who are close to him, who appreciate his death, because there was a moment when we didn't understand or appreciate what he did for us as well. So imagine the whole world and all of its inhabitants throughout all of time have been forgiven by God. Sins not being counted against them. And yet, so many people living without understanding that knowledge. That would be like basically someone coming and paying your mortgage off, but not telling you, and you just continue to pay every month, sacrificing significant amounts of your income to cover a mortgage that's already been paid. Isn't that a sad story? Or to be living with cancer and uh, how about this example? You're living with cancer and the cancer is taking its toll on you. And even the treatment 
is taking its toll on you. It, you. You live with the worry and the fear and the disease and the effects of even the treatment that are draining you of energy, causing you to lose your hair. And yet, what, what if the truth is you had already been healed of cancer and just didn't know? And you continue to live through the nightmare that cancer can be. You see, the world has been forgiven. God has declared forgiveness for each and every person in the world. But forgiveness is not all we need because God has made through forgiveness a way to the ultimate peace, which is reconciliation, that we would be reconciled to God now that we have had our sins forgiven. That that repentance that we feel, that turning away from a life of sin means that we turn toward God. Without turning away from a life of sin, even though my sins have been forgiven, I may continue to live in them. I may continue to practice them. I may continue to give myself over to that rebellion and that lostness and that hopelessness. And so here I am not realizing that my my. My sins have been cleansed, that I am washed and loved and cared for, but I continue to live as if I'm not. And the message of the gospel, the message of the good news is that we have been forgiven, not that we can be forgiven. It's that we have been forgiven and we can apply that forgiveness to ourselves and we are called then to become ambassadors, not of forgiveness, If you look closely at the scriptures, the Bible doesn't call us to be ambassadors of forgiveness. The Bible calls us to be ambassadors of reconciliation, helping the world to enter into a reconciliation with God for life, kingdom life now, abundant life now, and life eternal. It's the reconciliation with God, the living in fellowship with God and intimacy with God made possible by the forgiveness of our sins that God is desperate for all of us to experience, the whole world. In fact, 2 Peter 3, 9, you know this passage. When Peter was coming against those uh, folks, scoffers who said, well, we keep hearing about the Lord's return. We keep hearing about the Lord's coming. Where is this coming? We, of course, could say even more than Peter because we're 2,000 years removed from all of these events. Where is this Lord's coming? And many say that. Many even today in the church might say that. But this is what Peter wrote to the church. He said, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, his promise to return. As some understand slowness, those who who excuse slowness as as the reality that Jesus is not coming back. He says, instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. You see, forgiveness is a unilateral decision by God. He unilaterally decided to forgive all of our sins. But reconciliation is a two-sided street. It requires both parties. God has done all that is needed and stands ready for reconciliation. But until we recognize our need, until we repent of our sin, until we acknowledge and take hold of that forgiveness— and desire fellowship with God, repentance, excuse me, reconciliation will not happen. Our job as witnesses of God is to be ambassadors of reconciliation. We're trying to bring about the reconciliation that God has made available on the cross. And God wants all people to be reconciled. God wants all people to come into repentance. Now, God says at the same time, that's what I want, but I can tell you not all will. That doesn't mean God is declaring that I've made it impossible for them. He's saying that I see the end of the story, and the end of the story is so many will refuse to repent. Read the book of Revelation. There is a over and over again theme of, and even after all of this, they refuse to repent. I feel that same thing about our world today, that after all of the difficulties and hopelessness that we see around us, there are so many that refuse to repent and say, God, help us. Let me see, oh God, what it would look like to turn my life to you. So I say all of this to give us a vision that God 
cares about every person, that we no longer can live in the privilege of saying, well, some people are Muslim, some people are Buddhist, some people are Hindu, some people are atheist, some people are agnostic, as if that is justification for us to not care deeply in the way that God cares deeply about each one of them. Some of my children might get angry with me and turn away. My love for them is not going to stop. And I, uh, I would not want their brothers and sisters to say, well, they've just decided they hate God. There's nothing we can do. I would want them to be working as ambassadors of reconciliation, pleading with me, pleading with my children that, that are estranged from me. Let's bring about reconciliation. So I say all of this for this purpose. The task for us as makers of disciples, as disciple makers, is a worldwide task. It's an every human being task. It's a every neighbor, every coworker, every family member task because God wants all people to know he loves them, forgives them, and wants a relationship with them. We've got to stop listening to the secular stories and world uh, uh, views that tell us that only, we're only supposed to be talking to those who who really uh, are already followers of Jesus. We've got to remember that Jesus died for every single person, no matter who they are. And our job as ambassadors is to see reconciliation spread throughout our community. Now, I say that because we have to have that vision, that it is a worldwide, all of humanity vision. That means that we can't leave it up to just some people, some missionaries, some pastors, that we are in this together. There are people that will be only reached by your ambassadorship. They're not going to respond to my ambassadorship. They don't respond and even recognize perhaps my life or my ambassadorship, but you have a connection with them. They're in your household. They're in your family group. They're in your friend group. God has put you particularly in their life to be a witness of reconciliation. So we need to be passionate together about what God is passionate for as well. And that is that all people would come to know how much they are loved by God. We cannot let one hopeless person go. We can't just say, well, I, I, it doesn't matter. Not everybody. Some people are hopeless and that's their own. We have to love them the way Jesus did. We have to care for them the way Jesus commanded us to care for them. We have to make every single person our neighbor. That's what he taught us, right? It wasn't just those who were close by, who looked like us, thought like us, had the same political aspirations or affiliations as we do. We are called to make every person our neighbor and to make them our neighbor so that we can show them the love of God and that we might be agents or ambassadors of reconciliation until they come into the place of understanding how loved they are by the God of the universe. Guerrilla discipleship and all of what we're doing in our disciple-making means is because we see this as a, dis as a desperate situation, as a call by our Father to go everywhere we can, to be spiritually obvious without being obnoxious so that anyone that we encounter, in fact, everyone that we encounter, can have an opportunity of the hope that we have in Christ. I've talked to many people. Some tell me, well, I'm just not an evangelist. We're not inviting anyone to be an evangelist here at um, uh, Guerrilla Discipleship. We're inviting everyone to be simply a witness of what God has done in you and to help others discover for themselves how much God loves them. We're not asking you to start preaching. We're asking you to help others discover, make the, help them uh, see that the Bible is available, that it is accessible to them, that they can discover the love of God through it. We believe the word of God is powerful, that we believe that the spirit of God inhabits those words, that God inspired those words. And as we help people begin to read and discover the God who wrote those words, they will fall in love with him. So all of our praying for people in grocery stores and in our family, all of our prayer calendaring, it's all designed toward one end, and that is for us to partner with God to see the whole world come to know that they are loved and forgiven and cherished 
and given life abundantly through Christ Jesus our Lord. There is no real room for anyone to sit on the sidelines. There is no place for some to say, well, I can't do that. I'm not very good at it. All of us have been called to get out of our comfort zones. And I'm asking that you would just begin today in ways that you haven't or up your game today. Begin to to, to start a prayer calendar for uh, folks who you know are far from God and just reach out to them. How can I pray for you? I've been been praying and, and want to talk more. Begin to start spiritual conversations. See how you can move meaningful conversations to spiritual or casual conversations to meaningful. All of the tools. And let us know what other tools you need. Let's commit ourselves to this task. We have no idea when the day of the Lord's return will be. But we are called by him in obedience to live every day as if today is the day. That means we've got to prioritize along with all of the other parts of our life. We've got to prioritize being spiritually obvious without being obnoxious, being ambassadors of reconciliation so that by some means, any means, the God of the universe might use us to draw others to him that they might have life. Thank you so much for being a part of Guerrilla Discipleship. I I pray that you and I are journeying together in a way that is blessing your life and seeing others come into the blessed life that God has for them. I'll see you again next week.